The current Supreme Court appears poised to reconsider abortion rights in a way that we have not seen in the last 30 years. Today we'll be discussing and we have a special guest joining us. Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today we're joined by Alexia Korberg, a partner at the law firm Paul Weiss, and a current litigant in one of the most important reproductive rights cases currently at the Supreme Court. Alexia, welcome to Talks on Law. Thanks so much. It's uh, really nice to be here. We'll be discussing some of the history of reproductive rights. We'll look at what's going on today. I mentioned in the introduction, though, you currently have a case pending at the Supreme Court. Maybe as a quick teaser, what is that case? Perhaps you could share a little bit with the audience. Sure. Uh, So that is a case on behalf of Mississippi's last remaining abortion provider. Uh, Mississippi is one of several states that are actually only down to one uh, provider providing abortions for uh, folks living in the entire state. Uh, so our client in that case is Jackson Women's Health Organization. Uh, and that challenge uh, was to a ban on abortion at uh, 15 weeks gestational, uh, which, as I'm sure we will discuss, um, from uh, 1973 uh, until today, so from almost uh, half a century, has been just per se facially unconstitutional. Um, It's the law in this country. It has been the law in this country. The Supreme Court has affirmed it and reaffirmed it again and again that you uh, cannot ban abortion prior to viability, which is between 22 and 23 weeks gestational. So this is just a ban at abortion on 15 weeks per se facially unconstitutional uh, as every court that has considered this ban uh, and bans like it has held. And this case, as we'll discuss later, has in some senses shaken the hornet's nest when it comes to activity at the state level. Yeah, absolutely. This law was just, uh, you know, sort of unambiguously unconstitutional. Uh, The district court agreed with us. The Fifth Circuit agreed with us. uh, And when the state of Mississippi applied uh, for uh, a grant of certiorari before the Supreme Court, uh, no one thought that the Supreme Court was going to uh, take that case. And so when, in fact, the Supreme Court did ultimately take that case, though I should say many, many, many months um, afterwards and after Justice Ginsburg passed away and this composition of the Supreme Court changed, uh, when when the Supreme Court uh, agreed to take the case, they were absolutely signaling that they were going to revisit the fundamental right to safe and legal abortion that has been the law of the land in this country for again, half a century, uh, for the first time really meaningfully since uh, Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. Well, I think with that, you've, you've set the tone. Uh, one thing that, you know, that I'd love to do with this conversation that's perhaps slightly different from other legal conversations on current reproductive rights or abortion law is let's take a a look, and and I know you've written on it a bit, a look back at the history when it comes to reproductive rights in America. Where would you begin that that history or that journey? Sure. I mean, we can really go to the to the absolute beginning of uh, of of this land um, way before, uh, you know, the the colonists arrived. So um, Abortion was practiced among indigenous Americans prior to the colonist arrival. You, you said the Native Americans. We have information on termination of pregnancy from Native American tribes pre-European uh, uh, settlement? Absolutely. I mean, a- abortion has existed on this continent and, and others uh, for as long as uh, people have existed. Um, it's, uh, there's just you know, a really, really rich legacy of um, of people using uh, abortion uh, and sort of determining their uh, reproductive lives uh, for just you know centuries and centuries and centuries. You were mentioning uh, how it was treated, I suppose, in in colonial times or in early American times. Right. So when the colonists arrived, they brought the British rule, and the British rule was that uh, abortion was uh, completely legal until quickening which is uh, the point at which the pregnant person can feel the fetus moving, uh, which is typically around four to five months of pregnancy. And that was was the law um, under common law um, really up until the Civil War. 
Uh, states only began to pass anti-abortion legislation in the 1860s, um, and the first laws were really sort of vague and difficult to enforce. Um, thereafter, and sort of for the next century, through the mid-1900s until uh, Roe was decided in 1973, uh, state-level restrictions and enforcement uh, steadily increased. Uh, but even still, in, in the late 1800s, in most states, abortion was legal until quickening. But I do have to say, you know, of, of course, the, the history of this country is inextricably linked with white supremacy and slavery. Um, and the history and present of abortion regulation is very much the same. Um, so when I say that abortion was legal throughout the country until after the Civil War, um, what I, you know, what I actually mean is that it was only legal for white and non-enslaved people. Um, enslaved black women were not allowed to have abortions because white men owned black women's bodies. And those future children would be valuable property. Exactly. That legacy of some of the very first abortion restrictions having such a disproportionate, you know, impact and being really race-based um, is just part of the legacy of uh, of course, this country, but also really abortion regulations. Um, so, you know, but by the time Roe was decided in 1973, nearly all states outlawed abortion, uh, and only a minority of states made limited exceptions to save a woman's life or in instances of rape, incest, or fetal anomaly. We're going to be jumping into Roe. We'll be talking about another important case, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. But you mentioned at the time of Roe, this was radical in the sense that every state had laws restricting abortion. Almost every. There were there were a few uh, states that had uh, what was then called um, you know, abortion on demand, um, which was sort of a pejorative way of saying it, but but for the most part, quite unrestricted abortion access. But the vast majority of states had entirely uh, restricted or you know very. Uh, restricted abortion access. So I want to talk with you about Casey and Roe and what they established kind of to set a um, to set a baseline or a framework for for the conversation for today's debate. But I suppose we alluded to it before, but I want to get the cards on the table. I'm talking to someone who's not exactly exactly neutral. Um, would you consider yourself an, an activist or, or a partisan on this issue? You know, I, I would consider myself um, a uh, lawyer, an officer of the court, and um, someone who uh, has tremendous respect for our Constitution and the rights that we have under it. Um, and, uh, and in that capacity, as someone who uh, is, as a lawyer, working to um, make sure that the constitutional right to safe and legal abortion access uh, is one that uh, people continue to uh, have. And as a result, you are on which side of the V in, uh, in, the current, in the current case? You're suing on behalf of the abortion providers. Exactly. On behalf of the Jackson Women's Health Organization. And uh, so the clinic and uh, the providers and their patients. Why don't we get into Roe? I mean, as you mentioned and honestly, as most Americans, if they know anything about abortion rights, they know the name of Roe v. Wade. Uh, I guess as a quick framework, what did Roe establish uh, that's currently still good law? Yeah, absolutely. It is actually really important, um, especially with abortion rights, to actually sort of go back um, to Roe as uh, as really sort of the jumping off point. And, and, and you cannot understand the moment that we're in and how perilous it is and how uh, exceptional it is and how uh, precarious sort of the rule of law is without understanding Roe. So uh, Roe was a 1973 decision uh, in which the Supreme Court for the first time explicitly recognized that the Constitution protects a pregnant person's uh, liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. So the court held that the Due Process Clause protects the right to privacy that had been intimated by prior decisions involving uh, child rearing and the use of contraception, and that that right to privacy was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. The court also held that that privacy interest must be you know, balanced against 
government interest like protecting the mother's health and life of the fetus. Uh, and in order to balance those interests, the court sort of did the analysis, that balancing analysis, and determined that a pregnant person has an unqualified right to terminate a pregnancy during the first trimester, and that any law that interfered with that decision was necessarily unconstitutional. And then during the second trimester, uh, states could regulate abortion only in ways narrowly tailored to protect the pregnant person's health. Uh, and then finally, in the third trimester, which was uh, the point of viability under the medical technology available in 1973, uh, a state could choose to ban abortion as long as there were exceptions to protect the mother's health as necessary. Uh, and, you know, an, an interesting, in this, in this moment, in this particularly sort of politically polarized moment, I think an interesting thing to note is that, you know, the Roe decision was seven to two. Uh, and actually five of the seven justices in the majority establishing, uh, recognizing the constitutional right were Republican appointees. So it wasn't necessarily a clear cut partisan issue with, uh, you know, uh, vast majorities of, of the relevant parties on either side of the V. Or, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it is possible that um, the justices' personal feelings about abortion might have been connected to uh, their partisan affiliation, but at the very least, as jurists, uh, even you know, majority of Republican appointees recognized that the Constitution affords uh, a right uh, to abortion access. So Roe established. It sounds to me a couple of things, but one is this concrete. Uh, invaluable law in the first trimester where states really just can't interfere. And then a second trimester where they can only do so to protect the mother. Exactly. If, if the, the law basically has to be narrowly tailored to protect the mother's health. And of course, you know, what does that mean is what the next few decades were about, right? Where in the decades following Roe, um, states that were hostile to abortion began to really sort of push at, at that. What does it mean for a law to be narrowly tailored to protect a mother's, the mother's health? If you say that you passed it, you know, the law to protect the mother's health. Is that good enough? Exactly. And in all these subsequent decisions, as the Supreme Court over the decades were considering these, these various sort of um, attempts of by states to, to navigate, to push at those bounds, Again and again, even when the Supreme Court upheld certain of those restrictions, it affirmed Roe's central holding that uh, the Constitution affords a right to safe and legal abortion access. And you mentioned it, but that right, is this related to the penumbras and, and the privacy rights that we hold as, as humans? Exactly. Um, and, you know, an interesting, we, we can talk about uh, Casey, uh, but... One of the ways in which there was a bit of an evolution between Roe and Casey is that the Roe decision is uh, much more narrowly grounded in privacy and the notion of privacy, whereas uh, the Casey decision uh, acknowledges sort of the, the privacy interest and right, but actually grounds the right to abortion much more in a, in a broader and more expansive sense of uh, the right and tradition of liberty. Yeah, how do you mean? And this is a great way to transition into Casey, perhaps the, the second most important uh, abortion uh, case in Supreme Court history. Uh, let's just sort of, you know, lay, lay the groundwork. So Casey uh, is, was the, the next really, really blockbuster abortion decision. Uh, that came down uh, in 1992, and um, as we can as we can talk about at the time, everybody thought that the court was going to overturn Roe versus Wade, and instead, the court uh, again reaffirmed that there existed a constitutional right to abortion, uh, but at least in the language that the court was using, it was a plurality uh, decision to describe that right it used much broader language than the Roe decision had. 
So, you know, locating the right not in just a narrow sense of privacy, which is sort of a subset of liberty, but the much broader right and tradition of liberty that's been recognized in, you know, decisions on a whole, whole host uh, of issues. Um, and, you know, Casey did some other things too. So it um, practically, it actually rejected Roe's trimester framework as unworkable. Um, and uh, interestingly, you know, medicine uh, had advanced pretty significantly between the early 70s and the early 90s. And so uh, the, the point of, of viability, which is um, the time after which it becomes possible medically for a fetus to survive outside the room, um, had actually um, sort of decreased from about 28 weeks in the 70s to 23, 24 weeks of pregnancy, which is, which is actually where it sort of remains today. Um, so the technological, the medical advances in that period were much more significant than actually from 1992 to today in terms of viability. Wow, that, that kind of surprises me, but... One of the, one of the anxieties about Casey actually was... Um, because Casey, as I said, you know, abandoned the trimester framework and now established viability as um, the sort of framework for all the abortion jurisprudence to hang on. One of the anxieties at the time was, will medicine just make that sort of unworkable going forward? Is it just going to be a constantly moving target? Will there come a point where, you know, viability is, is, is so much sooner? Is week, week two and then... Um... Uh, then what happens? Exactly, but but it hasn't, you know, um, really viability, according to um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, is still between 23 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. So after Casey, you know, what, what Casey sort of established and made clear was pre-viability bans on abortion, so again, prior to 23, 24 weeks, were just per se unconstitutional. And then any uh, regulation of abortion had to pass the so-called undue burden test, uh, which was an analysis as to whether the law places a substantial obstacle, this is the, the language of, of the test, a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion of a non-viable fetus. And, you know, to just sort of contextualize again, and, and I, I bring up the political landscape just because the moment we're in right now is so politically charged, um, but the reason why everyone expected the court to overrule uh, Roe and Casey is that at that point, eight of the nine justices uh, had been appointed by Republicans. And the only remaining Democrat uh, appointed uh, justice had actually dissented from Roe. Hmm. But significantly, um, again, you know, the Casey court reaffirmed Roe's central holding. And in doing so, the plurality really... Um, explicitly talked about the importance of stare decisis, which is, of course, you know, following precedent. Respect for precedent. And uh, the court, the plurality talked very openly about the importance of the court's institutional integrity and legitimacy in the eyes of the public. Um, and the court uh, also talked about not just uh, the, the constitutional right to abortion, but also our constitutional right to rely uh, on laws. And this notion, which has been called the reliance interest, um, which is, it's an unenumerated right, but it's this uh, you know, constitutional sort of framework that says that we are all allowed to order our lives on the notion, on the understanding that the laws are not gonna change from out from under us. And at that point, the Casey court observed that at that point, an entire generation had come of age free to assume Roe's concept of liberty in defining the capacity of women to act in society and make reproductive decisions. Of course, now many more generations uh, have come of age uh, understanding that. Um, and the court in uh, somewhat you know, pretty moving language um, credited women's right to control their reproductive lives in Roe and or their line of cases rather that began with Roe with women's ability to participate in the economic and social life of the nation. 
And that's sort of, you know, that's all the all the lofty stuff. But so, but what did Casey do? What did Casey do with the law that they were considering? So um, the law that was actually at issue in Casey was a Pennsylvania law that had sort of several components, several different types of regulations and restrictions on abortion access. Um, ultimately, the court struck down as unconstitutional one part of the law uh, that required uh, someone, a married person seeking an abortion to notify their spouse. Uh, but... The court upheld uh, the informed consent and parental consent requirements. So if you were a minor, you had to notify your parents um, and a 24 hour waiting period, all under the undue burden analysis that those things didn't place a substantial obstacle in the path of uh, a person seeking abortion. So, you know, the Casey decision, if you even if you look at uh, at actually the, the newspaper headlines, on the day that Casey was decided, it's a really mixed bag because some are Roe saved or, you know, right to abortion strengthened and, and others are restrictions on abortion allowed to continue. And that decision also sort of produced a lot of uncertainty and allowed um, a lot of space for states who are hostile to abortion to try to push at the bounds of the abortion right and uh, meaningfully restrict access and play sort of play around with different ways to do so legislatively. And states have continued to push that line uh, ever since. Absolutely. Well, Roe was in 1973, Casey is in 92. It's been over 30 years since the most recent of the cases. I'm sure some reproductive rights scholars would would perhaps balk at me skipping over 30 years, but maybe we can take the opportunity to move into current time now. Um, what's interesting or new? We touched on it a bit before about the Dobbs case that you're working on. So what is uh, really sort of incredible about the Dobbs case in this moment we, we find ourselves in is that... Um, you know, the law at issue there, as I sort of said at the beginning, is a straightforward ban. It's not a regulation. There is no question that it's a pre-viability ban. In fact, at, from the very beginning in the litigation, the state of Mississippi admitted that 15 weeks is absolutely prior to viability. And 15 weeks, uh, just it's probably obvious to many, it's at the beginning of the second trimester. Exactly. So, you know, Mississippi is not the first state to pass, uh, it's not rather the only state to pass uh, such a blatantly unconstitutional ban. And in fact, um, it was made clear at the time that it was passed specifically to try to tee up this moment, which is to say uh, an invitation to the Supreme Court to overrule Roe. Um, But, you know, none of those you know, very cynically passed just, you know, per se facially unconstitutional laws um, had, I mean, every, every court that considered them, every district court, every appellate court in Mississippi and other states had been quite clear. You don't even need to take discovery into the issue. It's just, you know, again, per se facially unconstitutional. Um, and so, you know, when the state of Mississippi um, appeal to the Supreme Court, um, you know, no one thought that the Supreme Court would take the case. The Supreme Court obviously, you know, grants cert to a vanishingly small uh, number of cases, you know, less than 1% of those put before it, and only does so when uh, there is a circuit split or, you know, some unresolved open question of law, neither of which was the case here. Um, and, you know, when uh, the, you know, the, the timeline was actually really incredible. So, so the cert petition uh, was fully briefed. And then, uh, you know, the court conferences, which is to say um, meets and uh, the justices consider cases and whether to take them. They did that, I believe, 13 times, um, which is, uh, I believe, actually a, a record um, for uh, for the number of times a case has, con- has been at conference, or it's at least tied with uh, the record, um, and ultimately, you know, the 
only granted cert to the case after Justice Ginsburg passed away um, and Justice uh, Coney Barrett, uh, you know, joined the court. Exactly. So they considered it. I don't even know what that means. Why would they keep considering it so many times, over a dozen times? Well, um, I believe the rule is there has to be uh, at least four justices who want to take a case. Um, And so what that suggests to me is that uh, there were perhaps three justices for some period of time, but um, there wasn't a clear decision. I mean, clearly it was it was controversial um, because, again, you know, just the by very virtue of the fact that the court granted certain the case, it signaled to everyone that it was truly going to reconsider Roe, um, a you know a decision that not only had been law of the land for you know fifty years, uh, but also that the court had reaffirmed. Uh, less than a year prior in the June medical case, which was uh, a regulation that came before it, um, where the court uh, made clear in the, in the course of that decision that, uh, that again, Roe was the law of the land and that there was no question about that. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> and so it was, there was a clear signal um, that was sent to uh, all of us and this, many of the states who are hostile to abortion, that uh, it was quite possible that uh, the constitutional right would change. And, um, you know, that's it's an extraordinary thing, right? In, 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 this, uh, in this country, in sort of the arc of history, we don't take away constitutional rights. That's, that's not the direction in which it's supposed to go or ever has gone in. But uh, this particular case is signaling the possibility that that might be Uh, in the near future. Exactly. Well, we're going to talk about some of the reaction at the state level, but I guess, you know, before we do that, maybe we could talk a little bit more about Dobbs v. Jackson. Uh, In that case, you mentioned some of the steps for it to even make it to the Supreme Court, but since then, there have been oral arguments. What did you learn from that? Yeah, so um, there have been a couple of signals. So certainly I will say uh, the oral argument in our case uh, very much suggested that uh, the court is uh, inclined to, um, if not explicitly, uh, overrule Roe, um, you know, do so in any practical um, way. I mean, there's just no way that you can Um, uphold a 15-week ban without uh, gutting Roe. Um, Roe stands for the proposition that you cannot ban an abortion prior to, um, you know, ultimately viability as as sort of reworked by Casey or, you know, the first trimester. So um, so that's that's certainly one signal is to the justice's own questioning. Um, Another signal, though, is, you know, in the uh, meantime, uh, Texas passed this law, SB8, which uh, was effectively a ban on abortion at six weeks gestational, which is, uh, you know, really chilling um, in that, you know, most people don't know that they're pregnant until five or six weeks. Uh, and many people, at least um, according to, to several studies, at least a quarter of all people um, only know that they're pregnant in seven weeks or after. Uh, so what that means is it's a ban that basically makes it impossible to access abortion because you either don't know that you're pregnant or uh, you realize you're pregnant, but you can't get in to uh, a clinic, especially because the states that are hostile to abortion have passed all of these uh, regulations that have um, really made it quite difficult to actually access abortion. Um, and so this was just a, uh, again, blatantly unconstitutional law, um, in some ways even more flagrant, I guess, just by simple arithmetic uh, than the 15-week ban. If, if viability is 23 to 24 weeks, this is six weeks. Six weeks is even... This is first trimester. <laughs> exactly. But this, this law had some unique features to it, didn't it? It did. It did. It was uh, specifically... 
uh, designed to make it very difficult to challenge. So it, uh, it, it basically works, um, it's not enforced by government officials as uh, almost all laws are, uh, but rather it is uh, enforced by uh, regular citizens. It basically um, makes uh, everyone sort of bounty hunters who are able to uh, prosecute uh, anyone whom they think has uh, accessed the, their right to abortion, um, and uh, they're rewarded with a $10,000 bounty for doing so. Yeah, you say bounty hunters. I'm sure for those who aren't aware of this law, we might think you're exaggerating, but no, actually uh, bringing someone's abortion to the authorities is a payday for, for informants. Exactly. Um, and, you know, obviously this is just a, in addition to being patently unconstitutional, it is uh, just a really uh, cruel and corrosive law. You know, it really um, means that <laughs> neighbors are, you know, turning in neighbors. Um, it's also really, uh, all it takes is, you know, suspicion to sort of turn someone in. Um, it's really wide ranging. Um, you, uh, it targets not just those who are um, themselves availing themselves of their constitutional right to have an abortion, but you know, medical providers, um, anyone who aids and abets, which can be construed even as you know, driving a taxi to bring someone to the clinic, et cetera. Um, and so this, the, this patently unconstitutional law, um, the Supreme Court actually allowed uh, to go into effect and in um, oh, you know a lot of sort of technical backs and forths, um, it has had the chance to consider this law um, effectively multiple times, and has not only allowed the, the law to go into effect, but has ruled essentially um, that there is no pathway uh, to to even advance a lawsuit to challenge it. No path to standing. Exactly. And that decision is also itself uh, a clear signal uh, about what the court may do in uh, my case, the, the Jackson Women's Health Organization v. Dobbs, because, um, you know, it is, it is, it is suggestive of um, a real contempt for what has heretofore been a constitutional right. You say uh, no path. Um maybe for someone who wants to, to get an abortion. But how about a path for, say, a medical provider who is sued under the law? Uh, would, uh, of course, then you'd have to be in the very unfortunate situation where you're facing down large, large fines and perhaps having your practice shut down. Would such a medical professional have a path to, to sue? Not really, no. I mean, it is... Um, it, it is for all practical purposes, lawsuits um, have been sort of effectively foreclosed. And, you know, another thing that the law does, I mean, the law, the law was designed um, to really thumb its nose at um, a whole bunch of constitutional principles. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the law does is it actually says that any lawyer who represents anyone uh, in such one of these cases, if they're not fully victorious on every single count, they are liable for legal fees as well. So the lawyer is liable for the legal fees of the state? The lawyer is joint and severally liable uh, for its client's uh, liabilities, which include the legal fees of anyone who brought one of these suits. Fascinating. Yeah, I've never heard of anything like that. No, it's it's totally unprecedented. I mean, and even sort of taking a step back, even if you even if you don't care at all about <laughs> you know um, abortion access, if you just think about standing, like what is the purpose of standing? The the whole concept of standing is um, a belief, um, you know, at the sort of inception of our legal system uh, that lawsuits are are powerful and that they can be dangerous. And that we really only want, that we want to limit who can be, bring lawsuits um, and we want to limit who can be sued. And this law just totally perverts and subverts everything we know about standing because it makes it so that anyone can bring a suit, 
even and by necessity, people who were not injured themselves, right? Um, and uh, that the victims of their lawsuits now have no uh, redress themselves under the legal system. So since S- SB8 uh, or this Texas law that we've been talking about, what's that meant for abortion access in Texas? I mean, it's effectively uh, non-existent. It's been, it's been significantly, significantly chilled. Alexia, let's talk about, you mentioned that states react. <laughs> they, they saw this case at the Supreme Court as an opening. And when I say, what I mean by that is states that have been looking to curtail or abortion rights for, for some time. What are some of the reactions you've seen? We, we've talked a bit about Texas. Uh, what else is out there? Sure. Well, um, first of all, uh, a number of states are passing uh, essentially copycat bills. <laughs> so um, of that Texas law. Um, you're also seeing states try to pass or consider passing um, laws that are, you know, similarly unprecedented but different. Um, so, for example, a ban on um, citizens of one state even accessing abortion care in another state. Um, Missouri is thinking about banning uh, treatment for ectopic pregnancies. Yeah, what is an ectopic pre- pregnancy? It is a pregnancy where um, the fetus is not actually in the, the uterus. Um, so, uh, so as you can imagine, first of all, the fetus is necessarily not viable. Uh, a fetus cannot exist outside the uterus. And also they are tremendously dangerous, uh, for women. Um, they, ectopic present pregnancies kill women all the time. Um, and so if you just think about the absurdity, hmm. Yeah, there's no life to protect in this case, it sounds like, from, from your description. Necessarily, exactly. And there are states that are looking at banning that? Uh, Missouri is considering that law. Um, and, you know, that just lays bare the hypocrisy um, underlying uh, so many of uh, the abortion restrictions that have been passed over the last several decades, you know, um, by saying uh, the undue burden test, you know, required um, there not to be a substantial obstacle and, and by Roe saying that there has to be, you know, a balance and a regulation um, has to, you know, be narrowly tailored to further uh, essentially maternal health. A lot of states have passed laws claiming that they are about maternal health uh, when actually they were about controlling women's bodies and lives. Um, and the fact that we have these, that we now have these, these laws um, and this discussion about laws that are literally going to cause the death of women, um, f- f- you know, uh, all over, you know, truly, again, non-viable fetuses, um, just lays that bare. And, um, you know, the, the, the district court decision actually in, in our Mississippi case that's now before the Supreme Court, um, in... Uh, there, the professed reason for the law was maternal health. And in uh, Judge Reeves' decision uh, on the 15-week ban, um, striking down that law, he called that professed uh, interest in maternal health pure gaslighting. Hmm. He wasn't pulling any punches, this judge. No, no, he was not. Uh, It's a tremendously powerful decision. And one of the reasons why he said that is because actually... Um, in Mississippi, even specifically, um, maternal mortality rates are uh, horrific. It is so many times more dangerous in Mississippi to carry uh, a fetus and ultimately a baby to term uh, than it is to have an abortion. Like orders of magnitude more dangerous. Alexia, so some of the states have implemented laws that you described as just basically waiting for uh, Casey or Roe to be either overturned or reduced. Uh, others are are more in the, what I would describe as delay or perhaps pushing that limit on undue burden. Here we're talking about laws that may require women to receive counseling or 
watch videos and wait certain periods of time. What's what's out there right now when it comes to states uh, in in this realm of I suppose we could call it delay. What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say what's what is um, you know sad for me in some ways is um, the the types of laws that you're talking about um, in some ways almost seem quaint in comparison to uh, the taxes law and and ones that are um, coming to follow. But you know, for the last several decades, um, those types of laws that you're describing have been really the main. Uh, the main types of, or the only types rather, of abortion restrictions um, that have sort of existed at the state level. Um, and, and as you say, there's sort of different categories of them. So um, some of them are designed to make it harder for pregnant people to access care. So um, that is, you know, what you refer to as counseling. Um, that's sometimes what these, these laws are called. Um, counseling uh, is typically as these laws are designed, um, sort of, uh, as I designed to, uh, discourage someone from seeking abortion care. So, um, some of the counseling laws, like for example, in Mississippi, um, the counseling law, um, requires those receiving an abortion to be told by the doctor, uh, that abortions cause breast cancer. Uh, when, it, when in fact abortions do not cause breast cancer, there's absolutely no link. Um, or some of, um, in some states, that the counseling uh, is a requirement that the pregnant person listen to their fetus's heartbeat or uh, look at the screen when an ultrasound is being performed. In other words, uh, a way to perhaps force the connection with what had up until that point been an unwanted pregnancy or, or to create some sense of, of guilt in the, in the mother. Exactly. It is this sort of narrative, um, this idea that those who access abortion care come to regret their decision. Um, so, uh, so, so counsel, that, that counseling falls into that category. Um, mandatory waiting periods fall into that category. So um, you have to take multiple trips to the provider and have a waiting period between, you know, the first trip and when you actually actually access care, uh, which um, in effect presents a, a really practical hurdle to people accessing care. Um, if you consider you then have to uh, take time off of work twice. Um, the majority of people accessing abortion care already have um, a child, at least one child. So you have to find child care for that time. Uh, you, um, as a result of these and other laws, um, there are, as I said at the, at the outset, many states with only one provider in a huge state. So it, it's actually quite difficult to get to a provider and expensive, um, especially, for example, like in a state with Missis like Mississippi that doesn't really have public transportation infrastructure um, to travel hundreds of miles to get there. And now you have to do it twice. Um, and so uh, the the access, the barriers to accessing care are much greater for those who are, um, you know, at or below the poverty line. Uh, there's another category of, uh, of restrictions that are quite popular that are called trap laws. Yeah, what are, what are the trap laws? Yeah, those, those are targeted restrictions on abortion providers. And so the idea with those, with those uh, laws is to not necessarily uh, target uh, just the person seeking the abortion, but rather to target the providers and make it harder for them to provide care or more expensive for them to provide care. These are some of the laws that may require, you know, admission, hospital admission for the doctors or certain extreme or expensive um, requirements for the actual clinic. Exactly. So like the admitting privileges is a great example because, you know, um, they, these are laws that will say, for example, in order to provide abortion, you have to have admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of the clinic. Um, so one, there may not be that many hospitals within 30 miles of the clinic. Two, um, hospitals uh, within 30 miles of the clinic may actually refuse to provide privileges to anyone on the basis that they are providing abortion care. 
Um, and then sort of getting back to this tension that, that we talked about, about, you know, the purported, the professed interest in maternal life versus sort of the reality, there's actually no, um, there would be no benefit to have, to have your provider have admitting privileges at a hospital for a few reasons. One, abortion care is actually exceedingly safe. It is, it is tremendously safe. So very, very low likelihood that anything's gonna happen. Two, if something were to happen, um, it would most likely happen after you'd already left the clinic. Um, and again, most people have to travel significant distances. And so have your, your provider having admitting privileges at the clinic doesn't help you when you're now quite far away from the clinic if you are suffering an adverse health event, which again is very unlikely. And then most importantly, let's just say you do actually suffer an adverse health event at the clinic, your provider isn't going to go and treat you in the emergency room. You're, the, the, the clinic is going to call an ambulance and you're going to be taken to, um, you know, hopefully a trauma center or whatever, whatever is happening to you. And emergency physicians are going to be providing your care. It can, call, it can come under this umbrella of, it sounds like at least we're requiring a higher standard of care. And so as a result, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have much to complain about. In reality, it may be actually forcing a clinic to close. So those are trap laws. Uh, one other area that uh, I had noticed in, in prep was relating to insurance. Uh, what's going on with laws impacting insurance for abortion providers? I mean, to be honest, a uh, few things um, have hampered access to abortion as much as uh, the, the Hyde Amendment, uh, which is operates at the federal level. Um, it was passed in 1976 and it blocks Medicaid funding for abortion services, which means that the one in five women of reproductive age who are on Medicaid are unable to access abortion care. Um, and it's just another especially sort of cruel burden that falls on low income uh, and poor people um, trying to access care um, that is you know, especially devastating given the considerable economic hardship that childbirth uh, imposes. I'm already seeing this as a major theme of our conversation. It, it seems partly like we're talking about reproductive rights, or excuse me, abortion rights. But in reality, we're mostly talking about abortion access for lower income or, or poor Americans um, who may not have the, the ability to, to pay for, to travel, to take time off of work that many others would be able to do. There is no question that uh, the current framework of abortion restrictions uh, has an impact that falls absolutely disproportionately um, on, uh, on on poor on poor women. There's just absolutely no question. We see that in the data, um, in, and um, you know, I will say that the th this future um, that we may have after the court rules in uh, our case in uh, likely this summer um, is just going to be uh, the more extreme version of that because what we're going to see is um, a significant number of states um, rush to uh, outlaw abortion entirely. There are s several states that actually have laws in place right now that say that if Roe is ever turned, abortion is automatically uh, illegal in the state. So they're prepped and ready to ban. Exactly. They're called trigger bans. Uh, and um, what we're likely going to see is that um, in a huge, huge swaths of this country, uh, there is, it's going to be impossible to access care. And so the only people living in those states who are going to be able to access care are those who have the means to do so. We've been mostly discussing abortion as an in-clinic procedure, there has been, you know, especially during COVID, some conversations about outpatient abortion and, and medical abortion. Um, is that something that would perhaps expand to, to take care of some of this demand? Yeah, well, actually, you know, interestingly, even right now, um, the majority of abortions uh, in this country are by medication. They're by, they're by pill, um, a very safe uh, uh, pill regimen 
um, that uh, you can take from the comfort of your own home. Um, and so that's actually additionally a huge part of the absurdity of some of these laws. Um, those, for example, requiring uh, you know abortion clinics to um, have the same uh, be built to the same code and specifications as surgical centers. When <laughs> for the majority of people most people are taking a pill at home, is someone being handed a pill. So yes, theoretically, hopefully that is going to be um, one avenue by which folks can continue to receive care. However, um, the states that are hostile to abortion uh, have laws in effect that make uh, that very uh, practically difficult. So for example, Mississippi, again, um, Mississippi has a state policy that uh, is uh, um, supporting, favoring, encouraging the use of telemedicine um, because the state has, has is so rural and um, has, so, has such bad sort of public transportation inf- infrastructure. And yet, for abortion and abortion alone, the state of Mississippi has a ban that you cannot provide uh, abortion services via telemedicine. It's the only type of medicine you can't provide. Uh, you know, and, and many other states have the same. Um, so... It, it, it is an area of, um, of possibility. It is, you know, in, in, in Europe, for example, um, it is uh, certainly a path um, by which uh, people can quite easily access care, but it is a bit of a um, cat and mouse game, to be honest, with um, the states who are hostile to abortion. So we'd likely see some litigation on those types of issues. Can states ban access by mail to these types of, of medications? Um, or is there some type of interstate right or, or perhaps um, privacy right uh, to mail uh, being, being sent even in states that ban abortion? Yeah, it's, um, you know, to be honest, the most, uh, the most promising thing or, um, you know, uh, path, I suppose, is to establish a statutory right to access abortion care. At the federal level. At the federal level. Um, The House actually just passed the Women's Health Protection Act, which would do so, uh, and it failed in the Senate. Uh, But, you know, we are going to need federal action on these issues uh, to protect abortion access. You say one of the most promising, but uh, given the current makeup of the Senate, Uh, also currently unlikely. Yes, unfortunately so. I want to ask another question that perhaps may sound to many of our viewers that it it comes out of a a dystopian future, but have you seen states taking action to restrict or criminalize travel that would be related to abortion? Uh, There are are state legislatures, including uh, Missouri, that are uh, actively considering such laws. Alexia Korberg is a partner at the law firm Paul Weiss, specializing in complex civil litigation. Alexia, thank you so much for the time. It was a real pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks so much for having me. I mean, it's really a privilege to do this work uh, on behalf of these clients, and uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today.